When I bought my first copy of the Bible, the King James Version, it was to the Old Testament that I was drawn, with its maniacal, punitive God that dealt out to its long-suffering humanity punishments that had me drop-jawed in disbelief at the very depth of their vengefulness. I had a burgeoning interest in violent literature, coupled with an unnamed sense of the divinity in things, and in my early twenties the Old Testament spoke to that part of me that railed and hissed and spat at the world. Popular music, if we believe the evidence around us, is about cheerful, usually blonde teenagers wiggling their surgically enhanced bodies at us and singing about how wonderful their boyfriends are. Of course, if this were actually the case, we might as well offer our ears up for transplantation. Since the days of Screaming Jay Hawkins and Johnny Ray, there has been a thread of music that deals with pain, betrayal, drugs, evil and death. Past masters have included the likes of Leonard Cohen, Tom Waits, Johnny Cash and Tim Buckley. Over the last quarter century, one of the most successful miners of this black, grim seam has been a lanky Australian named Nick Cave. With a fluctuating team of collaborators, he has turned his bleak vision into prose, poetry, movies and, above all, a body of musical work that attracts fans who weren't even born when he started banging out second-hand Alice Cooper riffs on the outskirts of Melbourne in the mid-1970s. Nick Cave has been identified with the purveyors of that theatrical variant of post-punk called, often with a sneer, goth. His music, not to mention his wraith-like appearance, do have some similarities with bands such as Bauhaus and the Sisters of Mercy. But goth is essentially a development of rock music. Cave's style is based in rock, but encompasses French chansons, German cabaret, electronic experimentalism, country and western, blues, gospel and much, much more. And his subject matter is light years ahead from the warmed over fortune cookie occultism of the original goths. His heroes range from the obvious, such as Elvis Presley, to a 16th century barefoot saint and an Edwardian painter of cats who ended up in an asylum. He deals with the big subjects, from the existence of God to the morality of capital punishment. And yet, at the same time, he can write tender, heart-rending love songs that people play at their weddings. As he ambles into middle age, it's time to ask who this unsmiling misfit really is. How did a loving, supportive, middle-class family spawn a wild-haired, self-destructive, chain-smoking, smack-addicted maniac whose every live show seemed poised on the brink of violent anarchy? And how did that gangling freak end up as a singer-songwriter who ranks in critical respect alongside his own musical heroes? Someone who can stumble from the invisibility of subterranean gigs and late-night radio to an appearance on Top of the Pops alongside a wholesome soap star named Kylie. It's much harder for me to live in certain cities than other ones. London, essentially the reason why I live in London is because really no one cares in London who you are and it's such a sort of seething heap of people, you just get kind of lost in it. It's not the nicest place in the world to live but you can certainly be anonymous there. Warachnabeel is a small town in the centre of the wheat-growing region of the Australian state of Victoria, just over 300 kilometres from Melbourne. It's a quiet, prosperous place where the most exciting slice of history is a mock Tudor post office. Nicholas Edward Cave was born there in 1957, into a family that was as quintessentially middle class as the town. He was the third of four children of a teacher and librarian. Superficially, Nick fitted in with the priorities and aspirations of his parents, developing a love of literature and dutifully attending the Anglican church. In fact, his recording debut was with a church choir, performing a couple of Christmas carols for a charity record. However, young Nicholas was constantly aware that there was more to life than studying and praying hard and getting a respectable job. Even his interest in religion included a fascination with the roots of evil and violence. 
He became interested in some of the more extreme saints in history, especially the aesthetic poet St. John of the Cross, author of the devotional work The Dark Night of the Soul. He idolised another John, the country singer Johnny Cash, whose Man in Black persona would strongly influence Cave's performing style. Nick attended the prestigious Caulfield Grammar School in Melbourne and went on to study art at the Caulfield Institute of Technology. The most traumatic experience in his early years was undoubtedly the death of his father, Colin, in a car accident. It would be easy to blame the singer's later wildness on this tragedy, but it seems that he was already in a cycle of behavioural problems. In fact, he received the news of the crash while he was in a police station, having been picked up while drunk. Among Nick's other fellow pupils at Caulfield Grammar was Mick Harvey, with whom he formed a band. Australia was hardly an epicentre of rock and roll at the time, and most of the successful Australian acts, such as Frank Ifield, The Easy Beats and The Seekers, had moved to Britain or the States to make their name. The Boys Next Door, the group that Cave and Harvey put together with bassist Tracy Pugh and drummer Phil Calvert, drew heavily on the more outrageous elements of American rock such as the snake-wielding son of a preacher man, Alice Cooper. Another favourite was the hard-living Scottish exhibitionist, Alex Harvey. Slowly, word began to filter through that something strange was happening to the music scene in London and New York. Punk rock made little impact on most Australians, who spent the latter half of the 1970s in thrall to the likes of ABBA. The only notable Australian punk band had been the Saints, but they'd had to relocate to London to make an impact. But there were one or two Aussie hotspots of admiration for the three-chord wonderment and DIY noise-making. Melbourne was home to a shoestring record label called Suicide, who included three tracks by The Boys Next Door on a punk compilation called Lethal Weapons. One of them was a version of Nancy Sinatra's sleaze pop classic, These Boots Are Made For Walking, which came to the attention of Mushroom Records. Mushroom signed the band, which was now a quintet, with the addition of guitarist Roland S. Howard. However, nobody at the label knew how to deal with an act that seemed more intent on provoking audiences, and sometimes each other, into acts of violence than creating saleable tunes. Cave and his partners in Rhyme soon wanted out of their contract, especially when Mushroom released their aborted recording sessions as the album Door Door. The boys next door were driven to recording under an assumed name as the Torn Ox Bodies. At the end of 1979, the band was able to leave Mushroom and released the Hee Haw EP on Missing Link Records, but they soon realised that the Australian music scene could not accommodate them. They decided to relocate to London, and as a symbolic gesture, they changed their identity. The next single, the organ-driven love song Mr. Clarinet, was released under the deceptively jolly name The Birthday Party. I think it's great stuff, yeah. actually. Um, I haven't listened to it for quite a long time either. But there is actually a, uh, a the Peel Sessions are being put out, uh, for the birthday party Peel Sessions, which are uh, kind of interesting to listen to. One day to record three or four songs, whatever it is, mix and record, so they've got that kind of energy about them and, and uh, they're, they're pretty interesting. The London that awaited the birthday party in 1980 was not the punk rock El Dorado described in imported copies of the British music papers. The Sex Pistols had disintegrated, and the visceral impact of the early punk performers seemed to go with them. Record companies were now promoting performers ploughing the less raucous furrow identified as New Wave. However, the British music press loved the birthday party, especially their charismatic frontman. With his wildly spiked hair and haggard features, he seemed to follow in the satanic footsteps of the Pistols singer Johnny Rotten. The band was quickly snapped up by the indie label 4AD, home to the goth pioneers Bauhaus. The birthday party's repertoire had elements in common with the British band, especially their fondness for imagery borrowed from horror movies. 
While Pete Murphy of Bauhaus uttered hymns to the Dracula actor Bella Lugosi, Nick Cave screamed about horror sex vampires on the birthday party's 1981 hit, Release the Bats. But while Bauhaus's image was one of glacial menace, owing a great deal to David Bowie, the birthday party appeared more like fire and brimstone preachers having a nervous breakdown. Cave's lyrics seemed obsessed by violence, especially towards women. Lines like, I stuck a six-inch gold blade inside the head of a girl, gave the impression that these guys took no prisoners. The birthday party were critical darlings and proved to be a decent commercial success as well. But a combination of homesickness, drugs and incessant touring meant that the band was falling apart at the seams. Bassist Tracy Pugh was jailed for drunk driving, and then drummer Phil Calvert left to join the psychedelic Furs. In a desperate effort to hold the band together, Cave relocated from London, which was becoming intoxicated by the escapist cult known as the New Romantics, to Berlin. The move reflected Cave's new interests in music. He had become friendly with the guitarist Blixer Bargeld, leader of the German industrial band Ein Schortzende Neubarten, whose experiments with pneumatic drills made the birthday party seem mild-mannered. Berlin was also home to a tradition of grim, sardonic cabaret, best expressed by the music of Kurt Weill, and Cave was keen to expand his band's musical boundaries beyond the limitations of rock and roll. Apart from Bargeld, they had been working with the American singer Lydia Lunch, as well as their fellow Australians, the Go-Betweens, with whom they recorded as the Tough Monks. Cave began to feel that he needed a looser structure than the all-boys-together rock band format. A label change from 4AD to Mute also provided an impetus to change. In July 1983, the birthday party officially disbanded. I've, I came to London about 20 years ago or something like that and I've pretty much lived here on and off since then actually. I mean I've lived in uh, Brazil for a few years, in Sao Paulo and I've lived in Berlin for a few years and, uh, but mostly I always end up coming back to London. With the birthday party consigned to history, Cave appeared to be at a loose end. He spent some time in Los Angeles where he began writing a movie script, then went to New York where he hooked up with his friend Lydia Lunch, as well as Soft Cell frontman Mark Almond and Nick's fellow Australian Jim Thurlwell, who performed under a multitude of pseudonyms, all of them including the word fetus. This strange foursome performed a few shows in New York and Washington DC under the name Immaculate Consumptives. Returning to Australia, he hooked up with Mick Harvey and Tracy Pugh, as well as guitarist Hugo Race and Barry Adamson, formerly of British post-punk outfit Magazine. At first, Cave called the band The Cavemen, under which name they recorded a version of I Put a Spell on You, penned by the voodoo-inspired rock and roll icon Screamin' Jay Hawkins. This identity was quickly replaced by The Bad Seeds. Cave had used the reference for the title of a birthday party EP, drawing it from a 1956 movie about a psychopathic child, as well as the parable of the sower in the Gospel according to Matthew. Cave went back into the studio with a core group of Mick Harvey, Barry Adamson and Blixer Bargeld, augmented by Hugo Race, Ed Clayton-Jones and Nick's girlfriend Anita Lane. The first fruit of these recordings was an over-the-top version of Elvis Presley's 1968 hit, In the Ghetto, followed swiftly by the first Bad Seeds album, From Her to Eternity. The songs proved that the Bad Seeds had lost none of the grubby menace of Cave's previous bands, but had replaced noisy violence with brooding menace. Particularly grim were the intense title track, The Diary of a Homicidal Stalker, and a version of Avalanche by the poet laureate of glumness, Leonard Cohen. Back in Berlin, Cave began writing a novel, which would be published under the title And the Ass Saw the Angel, and working on songs for the next album. 
The firstborn is dead was another biblical reference with connotations of the plagues of Egypt in the book of Exodus. It was also a reference to Elvis Presley's stillborn twin, Jesse Garan, whose death was described in the opening track, Topello, based in a song by bluesman John Lee Hooker. Indeed, much of the album is a potted history of the greats of American music, with a tribute to the blues pioneer Blind Lemon Jefferson and a cover version of Bob Dylan's Wanted Man. Cave, it appeared, had broken free of the straitjacket of punk rock and was extending his creative abilities into new fields. But just like the blues heroes whose praises he sang, his own demons were catching up with him. To me, the, the, the essential part of the whole process is writing the songs, going into the office, working hard, um, and, and it's very much that part of it that, um, that I enjoy. The making of the record is, very, is a very short thing, it only lasts a month or so. Um, it's a period of intense creative activity, but really the songs have been written um, for me, so, so I'm, and after that, uh, you kind of kiss the record goodbye. and, and kind of weighed into sort of months and months of, of other stuff. Cave's fondness for music from many different genres had led to numerous cover versions. Indeed, the first single by The Boys Next Door had been an unlikely perspective on the work of Nancy Sinatra. For the third Bad Seeds album, Kicking Against the Pricks, he decided to concentrate entirely on non-originals. Many of the songs were what observers of Cave's career might have expected, including the John Lee Hooker murder ballad, I'm Gonna Kill That Woman, and two songs by Johnny Cash. Alex Harvey, an early influence on The Boys Next Door, is represented with the Hammer song. However, Cave also found new perspectives on pop hits from the 1960s, including Gene Pitney's Something's Gotten Hold of My Heart and Jimmy Webb's By the Time I Get to Phoenix. He even paid tribute to his squeaky clean compatriots, The Seekers, whose song The Carnival Is Over became a heart-rending tale of lost love. The album's title, incidentally, is yet another biblical reference, this time from the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. Kicking Against the Pricks saw the arrival of drummer Thomas Weidler from the Berlin band Die Haut, who had supported the birthday party in 1982, and on whose Burn in the Ice album Nick sang the following year. Kicking Against the Pricks was also graced by the last recordings of birthday party mainstay Tracy Pugh. He had been suffering from epilepsy, and in 1986 he died after a severe seizure. The covers album was followed in swift succession by a collection of originals entitled Your Funeral, My Trial. The high point is the xylophone-driven The Carney, which sounds like the terrifying flip side of The Carnival Is Over from the previous album. Cave's other influences were many and various, from the works of Tennessee Williams, whose play A Streetcar Named Desire influenced Stranger Than Kindness to a feud with a number of London music journalists who get a verbal kicking in scum. One of these was Antonella Gambotto, who, in a piece for Zigzag magazine, probed him rather too deeply about the collapse of his relationship with Anita Lane and his drug habits. Cave's heroin use was an open secret in music circles, but he appeared to be sensitive about the knowledge entering the public domain. He claimed to have his addiction under control, but it would soon have a negative impact on his ability to work. In the early stages of recording Your Funeral, Barry Adamson quit the band, leaving a core trio of Harvey, Weidler and Bargeld. These three would provide the heart of Cave's backing group for the next decade and a half. However, his inspiration was spreading beyond the realms of music, and it would be two years before another Bad Seeds album hit the markets. Um, I've often thought, um 
how nice it would be to to um um to drop the whole thing altogether, the whole creative uh, thing or the whole uh, notion of being creative. But it doesn't really last very long with me. I find that um, I, I really need to do it, and if I don't do it, I become an absolute nightmare to be around. And you know, it keeps me. Um, it keep. It makes me better. Music had never been the sole motivator in Nick Cave's creative life. His studies at art college had encouraged a fascination with painters as diverse as the 16th century Spanish mannerist El Greco and the British illustrator Louis Wayne, whose bizarre paintings of cats reflect his descent into insanity. Cave's first published book was King Ink, a collection of lyrics, poems and other writings published in 1988. The following year saw the appearance of his novel and The Ass or the Angel, which showed the literary influences of William Faulkner, James Joyce, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, not to mention Cave's old favourite, the Bible. The deformed, inbred anti-hero Eucrid Eucro has elements of the prophets of the Old Testament and the hermetic saints of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. The title was yet another biblical reference, this time from the Book of Numbers. However, Cave's most successful sideline has probably been his association with the cinema. His first film appearance was as far back as 1983, in Heiner Mullenbrock's movie Die Stadt. But it was in the second half of the decade that his involvement in the world of cinema really began. With the bad seeds, he appeared in Wings of Desire, the 1987 allegory about an angel who sacrifices his special powers for love in the divided city of Berlin. Cave's appearance and music, especially the carny, adds to the bruised, bleak romanticism of the whole movie, which was directed by Wim Wenders. Incidentally, Wings of Desire later received the dubious honour of a Hollywood remake called City of Angels. Don't go there. Cave had also been working on a film script about life in prison for most of the 80s. Ghosts of the Civil Dead finally made it to the screen in 1988, directed by John Hillcote. It's a bleak parable about a high-tech prison and features Cave in a key role as the psychopath Maynard. He also composed the score with the assistance of Blixer Bargeld and Mick Harvey. Three years later, he played a rock star called Freak Storm in Johnny Suede, notable for offering an early starring role to Brad Pitt. As his commercial viability as a musician began to take off in the 1990s, Cave's acting projects took something of a back seat, although he did have a role as a CD strip club manager in the European film Rhinoceros Hunting in Budapest. Nonetheless, many moviegoers became aware of his work when his songs cropped up on soundtracks. At first, it was mainly art house productions that made use of Cave's music, including Alison Anders' Gas Food Lodging, the controversial intimacy, and a reunion with Wim Wenders on Until the End of the World. As his fame progressed, however, his music was used on big-budget projects such as the Scream horror spoofs and Shrek 2. Then, more than a decade and a half after Ghosts of the Civil Dead, he reunited with director John Hillcote for a violent Australian western called The Proposition. With the script by Cave and featuring Guy Pearce, Emily Watson and Ray Winston, it's scheduled for a 2005 release. It is a love-hate relationship because the pervading feeling that I get after making a record is always a sense of disgust about the whole thing. That These are songs that I've been working with on my own in the, in the studio. I've played hundreds and hundreds of times on my own in, in, the, in the office. They're mine and there's a, a giving over of them with the making of the record and, and a complete uh, saying goodbye to them after you've done the record uh, where you're just kind of left with nothing. In 1987, Cave reconvened an expanded lineup of the Bad Seeds. Joining in the fun were guitarist Kid Congo Powers, formerly of Psychobilly Pioneers The Cramps and Gun Club, and keyboard player Roland Wolf, an associate of Blixer Bargeld from Berlin. 
The resulting album, Tender Prey, was as bleak and howling as anything he'd created, and was crowned by one of his greatest songs, the epic The Mercy Seat. Over seven minutes of relentless riffing, Cave sings from the perspective of a man approaching the electric chair. That would be grim enough, but he adds enough biblical references to remind all listeners of their own mortality, until he starts to sound like some kind of demented snake-handling preacher. Other notable tracks included the serial killer Hoedown Deanna and the closer New Morning, which refers to the work of Cave's beloved Bob Dylan, while echoing the emotional sing-along qualities of the Bad Seeds earlier version of The Carnival Is Over. By early 1988, Cave's drug use had become a serious impediment to his work, and after a couple of brushes with the law, he agreed to undergo rehab. Returning for the release of Tender Prey and the subsequent world tour, he also agreed to settle down with his girlfriend Viviane Carniero and their son Luke in the homeland of Brazil. The combination of sobriety and domestic stability inevitably had an effect on Cave's songwriting. But if anybody expected his next album to be a cheery rediscovery of the delights of sunshine and bunny rabbits, they were to be disappointed. The next album, The Good Sun, shared some of the fire and brimstone intensity of its predecessors, but replaced it with a wistful melancholy, with restrained strings adding to the emotional effect of the music. The opening track, Foi na Cruz blended passages of Portuguese, the national language of Brazil, with quotations from the Book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. But the biggest shock for long-term devotees of Cave Sound came on the ship song. Nobody died, Satan was absent, and there were no nods to the Bible. Instead, Cave fashioned a moving, heartfelt love song to Vivian. It seemed that the sober family man was toying with a new emotion, happiness. We sell, a f we s I, I sell quite a lot of records, um, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's not millions and millions of uh, dollars involved. Um, we don't sell huge amounts in America, which I'm always kind of relieved about. Um, so we really have the freedom to do pretty much exactly what we, we like. And, uh, and that's, to me, that's the most important thing, is having some kind of freedom. For his next album, Cave enlisted the producer David Briggs, who had made his name with the legendary singer-songwriter Neil Young. Kid Congo Powers had left the band, but the lineup was consolidated with the arrival of two new Australians, pianist Conway Savage from the White Buffaloes and bass guitarist Martin Casey, formerly of the Triffids. Both men were to remain bad seeds well into the 21st century. The recording process didn't go as smoothly as the participants might have hoped. Briggs's taste for stripped-down simplicity might have been suitable for young songs of mythical Americana and blistering guitar solos, but Cave's style and subject matter was more complex, pitching love and death, God and Satan into a musical gumbo of Delta Blues, Berlin Cabaret and punk nihilism. Cave took charge of the remixing process to relieve what he saw as Briggs's dull production. Something must have worked because it was the songs on Henry's Dream that began to pitch the bad seeds towards some sort of commercial success. Papa Won't Leave You Henry and Jack the Ripper were songs of simmering evil that could have appeared on any bad seeds album to date, while Loom of the Land and Straight to You were tender love songs. The latter even made it into the British charts as a single, albeit for a solitary week at number 68. Immediately after the release of the album, the band went out on a live tour, captured on the electrifying Live Seeds album. The cover of Henry's Dream showed Cave on a massive billboard in a desert landscape. This David Lynch-style image was intended to be ironic, but the idea of Cave as a bankable star slowly became a reality as the 1990s progressed. Part of this was down to his incessant work rate. Soon after Henry's Dream, he contributed to a Leonard Cohen tribute album with a cover version of Tower of Song. Few listeners realised that the five-minute version of the CD was cut down from a take that lasted over an hour. 
He also helped out his director friend Vim Vendors with the soundtrack of his movie Until the End of the World, and collaborated on a bizarre version of What a Wonderful World with Shane McGowan of the Pogues. On the flip side, McGowan performed Cave's song Lucy from The Good Son, and Cave sang the Pogues' mournful rainy night in Soho. 1993 saw Cave and his family relocate to London, the city he'd left in disgust a decade before. It was there that he began to work on his next album, Let Love In. Highlights included the pulsating paranoia of Red Right Hand, a track that could have graced a Sergio Leone western, and the terrifyingly intense two-parter, Do You Love Me, which tops and tails the album, and to which the only sensible answer must be no, and I've got a gun. Variety comes with the gentle, self-searching Nobody's Baby Now, which couples Cave's fascination with the mysteries of love and religion, and subtly borrows from Van Morrison's psychosexual 60s classic, Here Comes the Night. The Bad Seeds were gently nudging their way out of the indie ghetto and into a wider public consciousness. At the suggestion of their record company, Mute, the band began to take part in major multi-artist tours and festivals, such as Lollapalooza in the United States and the Big Day Out in Australia. Unsurprisingly, Cave, a denizen of late-night bars and bleak attics, felt distinctly uncomfortable with the spectacle of tens of thousands of boisterous rock fans cavorting in fields at the height of summer. But he had to acknowledge an awful lot of them seemed to know the words to his songs. The Bad Seeds were staggering, sometimes sideways towards the mainstream. The next album would get them there, if only briefly. They just needed the assistance of some well-placed friends. Well, there is, there is one on, on the Murder Ballads record, which is, I don't know, it's 15 or 16 minutes long. That's constant singing. It, it, is, it is probably too long. <laughs> the but. point being, that was, high, that was heavily edited. It could have gone, you know, it could have gone for hours and hours. Perhaps the clearest evidence of Nick Cave's success during the 1990s was the number of bands who seemed indebted to the Bad Seas influence. The British band Tindersticks had elements of Cave's cabaret noir, and Gallon Drunk were suffused by a cave-like taste for underlying violence, while both groups favoured seeds-like dark suits as stage wear. Tindersticks supported the Bad Seed several times in the decade, and Gallon Drunk's James Johnston played with the band on many occasions, eventually becoming a full-time member in 2004. But some other links were less likely. For example, the American thrash metal titans Metallica covered Lover Man from Let Love In, and anarchic New Yorker's Bongwater even recorded a tongue-in-cheek tribute called Nick Cave Dolls. But the most incongruous member of the Bad Seed fan club was a fellow Aussie called Kylie Minogue. At this stage, Kylie had left behind her the first chart incarnation as a fresh-faced girl next door, but was yet to offer the world her hot-panted buttocks as a pop cultural icon. Her relationship with In Excess star Michael Hutchins had meant that she now spent more time in the gossip columns than in the charts. The fact that she might want to be associated with Nick Cave to achieve a little second-hand credibility was understandable. What was less expected was that Cave responded positively, seeing something worthwhile beneath the pop star fluff. Kylie fitted neatly into Cave's new project, a cycle of songs revolving around violent death, appropriately entitled Murder Ballads. She duetted with him on the track Where the Wild Roses Grow, which made the British Top 20 and led to Cave's debut on Top of the Pops. The song and its accompanying video, which concerned Kylie's character Eliza Day having her head smashed in with a rock, drew shrill allegations of misogyny. This rather missed the point. The album was packed with all-purpose violence directed at men and women without favouritism. For example, the other duet on the album was Henry Lee, on which the title character is stabbed by his girlfriend. His partner on this track was Polly Jean Harvey, with whom he was also enjoying a tempestuous love affair. 
Other highlights of the album included the 14-minute-plus O'Malley's Bar, in which Cave's character kills a dozen people in the eponymous saloon, and The Curse of Millhaven, about a female serial killer whose victims may or may not include a dog. Apart from the regular seeds, the album credits included two new members, New York percussionist Jim Sklavounos and violinist Warren Ellis of the Australian band The Dirty Three, old buddies Anita Lane, Hugo Race, Shane McGowan and James Johnson, and Australian musicians Dave Graney and Brian Hooper. Most of them came together for the album Closer, a sing-along version of Bob Dylan's Death Is Not The End. For some time, Cave's muse had flip-flopped between two main strands of inspiration, gothic violence and tender love. Murder ballads was weighted down towards the former, possibly to the point of self-parody, so it was hardly a surprise that his next long player would balance the equation. The Boatman's Call is a selection of love songs, many of them sparsely arranged and piano-led. The melancholy air that suffuses the album was attributed by many critics to the fact that Cave's relationship with Polly Jean Harvey had ended. Cave wasn't saying. Pretty much so. We're on 4AD for a little bit yeah. initially. Mute have some highly successful bands yeah. in the sense that uh, they don't interfere with uh, what, what you record. You go into the studio, they have this kind of bizarre idea that the musicians know what they're doing, which is kind of rare in the music industry th these days. They allow you to get on with it, present the, the, the record company with your, your record, and, and then they put it out. And, uh, and, and that's an incredible uh, freedom to have. The deeply personal love songs contained on The Boatman's Call were critically successful, but the album failed to scale the commercial peaks of murder ballads. Mute took the easy option of releasing a best-of compilation in 1998, put together by the ever-faithful Mick Harvey. But there would be a four-year gap before the Bad Seeds reconvened for another studio album. This didn't, of course, mean a long holiday for Cave. He became a quasi-academic, performing his lecture The Secret Life of the Love Song and writing an introduction to Mark's Gospel for the Canongate Bible series. The Secret Life was released as a CD in 1999, as was the recording of an earlier musical reworking of And the Ass Saw the Angel, on which he worked with Mick Harvey and Ed Clayton Jones. In the same year, he received the accolade of being asked to curate the Meltdown Festival. This annual event is based around the taste of one person, usually a musician, and Cave came up with a predictably weird and wonderful roster of guests, including Velvet Underground founder John Cale, politically engaged singer-pianist Nina Simone, pulp frontman and thorn in Michael Jackson's side Jarvis Cocker, and eccentric songwriter and sometime Nancy Sinatra collaborator Lee Hazelwood. The latter was, of course, the composer of These Boots Are Made For Walking, the song that had kicked off Cave's recording career more than 20 years before. On top of all this, in 2000, his idol Johnny Cash recorded Cave's song The Mercy Seat on his album American Recordings 3. And on a more intimate note, he was back in a settled relationship with the model Susie Bick, whom he married in 1999. He had not been lazy on the performance or songwriting fronts either. While most of the individual Bad Seeds had their own projects to occupy them, Cave made occasional concert performances with small groups, trying out a mixture of old and new songs. When the band got back in the studio again in 2000, accompanied by the Canadian singing sisters Kate and Anna McGarrigal, Cave was stoked up with new musical ideas. The resulting album, No More Shall We Part, continued with the piano-driven sounds of The Boatman's Call, but with more complex instrumentation and much use of string sections. Cave's settled domestic arrangements meant that the love songs were less fraught and tormented. Instead, he turned his furrowed brow to his other big subject, the Christian God and his relationship with man. His lyric writing, meanwhile, took on a new complexity and a love of wordplay for its own sake. The song God is in the House made a leap from a gentle image of small-town America to queer bashers with tire jacks and goose-stepping, twelve-stepping teetotalitarianists. 
Unfortunately, these new directions in words and music didn't translate into songs as intense as The Mercy Seat or as tender as Into My Arms. God was in the house, but he seemed to have left his divine inspiration somewhere else. This slump in Cave's writing standards was shown up shortly afterwards when he was asked to contribute a Beatles cover version to the soundtrack of the Sean Penn movie, I Am Sam. His version of Let It Be, gentle but not soppy, showed what a great performer he could be when given the right material. Although Cave attempted to keep his private life private, the critical consensus was that a happy marriage had taken the fire out of his soul. When he became the father of twin boys, Arthur and Earl, the image of a nappy-changing, buggy-pushing Cave, still dressed in a sharp black suit, of course, became irresistible. Unfortunately, his 2003 album, Nocturama, only added to the sense of disappointment. When news leaked out that the McGarrigal sisters had been replaced as backing vocalists by the Blockheads, erstwhile backing combo to the late Ian Drury, it seemed to be a sign that Cave really wasn't taking things seriously. Final evidence of this was the closing track Babe I'm On Fire, which was longer even than O'Malley's Bar on murder ballads and had sillier lyrics than God Is In The House on No More Shall We Part. His references to a Chinese abortionist, a menstruating Jewess and hymen-busting Zulus were either consciously offensive, possibly even racist, or were just slapped together in the studio because the words sounded good. Nick Cave, uncomfortably happy family man, was rapidly becoming a parody of his old self. I guess the difference with this record as well is that I now have an office, I pretty much work uh, nine to five. I go in there every day. Um, I spent I spend a certain amount of hours a day playing the piano and singing every day, except Sundays. <laughs> and uh, and you know and that seems to work incredibly well as long as I turn up there and I sit down at the piano or sit down at the typewriter or whatever. Um, the songs just come. Around the middle of 2003, some residents of the British seaside town of Brighton might have noticed a tall man in his mid-40s walking to work. Now that he had order and harmony in his home life, Nick Cave was determined to bring it to his songwriting. Stung by the dismissive reviews of his last two albums, he knew he had to make up some goodwill. With his only stimulants, coffee and cigarettes, he worked in an office a short distance from his home, distinguished from a million other small offices only by the piano set up there. Just like an ordinary commuter, he would work a nine to five day, then return to his wife and children. Even his hair seemed to have been tamed, although this may have been a reaction to encroaching baldness. So far, so humdrum. The critics who surmised that domestic normality had sapped the brooding intensity from Cave's songwriting rubbed their hands in glee, waiting for banal songs about mortgages and pleasant strolls along the shingle. They were to be disappointed. If Cave's emotional life was free from upheavals, his working relationships were more than compensating. Blixer Bargeld, his guitarist and faithful friend for more than 20 years, had left the bad seats. In response, Cave went out on tour with a stripped-down version of his band featuring just Martin Casey, Warren Ellis, Jim Sklavunos and himself. Armed with a few songs created by this quartet and the products of his Brighton office, he reconvened the whole team in the studio, now with the permanent addition of longtime auxiliary member James Johnson on organ. It was a make-or-break situation and everybody knew it. None of the Bad Seeds relied exclusively on their membership of the band. Warren Ellis was still performing with the Dirty Three. Jim Sklavunos enjoyed great critical success with his theremin and tuba-driven outfit, The Vanity Set. James Johnson, in addition to Gallon Drunk, had developed a side project called Bender with photographer Steve Gullick and filmmaker Geraldine Swain. Mick Harvey, ever hyperactive, had kept up a constant stream of albums, especially soundtrack work and two tributes to the French singer-songwriter Serge Gainsborough. He also seemed to be getting into the habit of collaborating with Cave's ex-girlfriends, having made albums with Anita Lane and Polly Jean Harvey between Bad Seed sessions. 
Cave himself had also been busy on the music front doing more soundtrack work and recording a version of I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry with Johnny Cash for the country legend's final album. Cave's big idea was effectively to record two albums at once, uniting the two dominant sides of his music. They would be distinguished by the choice of drummer, the wild, punkish, gothic howls that harkened back as far as the boys next door featured the clattering, skin-spanking of Jim Sklavunos. The more tender, thoughtful moments had the more sensitive Thomas Weidler take over the stool. The masterstroke, however, was to bring in the redemptive sounds of the London Community Gospel Choir. The rock gospel interface wasn't new, both blur and spiritualised, had made use of it in recent years. But Cave felt that he, with his long-standing fascination with the power of religious faith, had more right to use the genre than most. The first disc, Abattoir Blues, kicked off with a prime piece of high-energy Bad Seeds rock. On the face of it, the lyrics of Get Ready For Love were those of a hymn. But there were numerous wry digs at those who blindly follow religion, such as praise him till you've forgotten what you're praising him for. The full-throated call and response of the choir added to the ironic ambiguity. Elsewhere, he produced a new roster of heroes and villains to stand alongside the old as There She Goes, My Beautiful One, chronicled the comings and goings of the post-impressionist artist Paul Gauguin and irascible English poet Philip Larkin, as well as self-destructive geniuses such as Dylan Thomas and Johnny Thunders, and Cave's old pal St John of the Cross, who did his best stuff imprisoned in a box. Let the Bells Ring paid a fond farewell to another old friend, as Cave tells the tale of the departed Johnny Cash, all the way from Arkansas. The title track of Disc 2, The Liar of Orpheus, retold the Greek myth of the great musician Orpheus, setting it in a nondescript garden shed. There were walk-on roles for God, who hit Orpheus with a hammer, just as he does to the narrator of the Hammer Song, and the musician's wife, Eurydice threatening to shove Hubby's lyre up his ass. Cave may have lost a little of his youthful intensity, but his absurd sense of humour appeared to remain intact. Further into the record, Carry Me was a gentle song that might have been about God, or about a lover, or probably about both. And O oh Children bounded back to the blood-soaked territory of murder ballads with the tale of yet another demented serial killer. The critics' fears were, it seemed, unfounded. He had not gone soft in his middle age. Not that he'd ever really taken the critics into consideration, except as raw meat for his lyrics. From his featureless office in Brighton, he had produced some of the best work of his long career. Nick Cave had scrabbled back to the top of the dung heap. I believed in God, but I also believed that God was malign, and if the Old Testament was testament to anything, it was testament to that. It was a wonderful, terrible book, and it was sacred scripture. I spent my pre-teen years singing in the Wangaratta Cathedral Choir, and even at that age I recall thinking what a wishy-washy affair the whole thing was. The Anglican Church, it was the decaf of worship, and Jesus was their Lord. Nick Cave has rarely been a huge commercial success. His work sells when it appears on big-budget Hollywood soundtracks or when someone more famous shows up to duet with him. His gigs sell out, but only because of the devotion of hardcore fans. He's never really managed to crack America, supposedly the desire of all rock stars from outside the United States. He can't even be said to have been the forgotten instigator for a successful genre of music. The bands that name his as an influence on the various spin-off projects of the individual Bad Seeds tend to be even less successful in sales terms than Cave's own records. So what is the big deal? Well, Cave sticks out like a red right thumb in the modern pop landscape, partly because of his choice of subject matter. As Western culture develops the attention span of a goldfish with advanced Alzheimer's, and pop music is ruled by vacuous studio creations who are contractually obliged to say nothing interesting ever, he reaches out beyond the boundaries of rock into art, religion, history and literature. He is ferociously well-read, and he sees no reason why his listeners should not keep up. 
At times, it seems that mere music cannot contain him, as relaxation after the release of Abattoir Blues and The Liar of Orpheus, he curated a season of his favourite films about Berlin, including a 12-hour epic directed by Rainer Werner Fassbinder. It's possibly this fascination with the world beyond his Brighton window that keeps Cave apart from the crowd. There are other intelligent songwriters at work today, of course. Morrissey and Elvis Costello spring to mind, but their main subject matter is themselves, their hopes, fears and longings. Cave deals with the tribulations of his own life, although not as explicitly as some might wish. But he's just as likely to draw his inspiration from Dostoevsky, Nabokov or that eternal standby, the Old Testament. Of course, some might argue that dealing with big subjects such as love and God isn't really that new. Black soul musicians such as Marvin Gaye and Al Green made entire careers based on the spiritual and emotional tensions between lust, penitence, sex and damnation, the devil's music and the word of the Lord. The devil may have the best tunes, but he shares them with the boss. It's a combination that has cropped up in the most unlikely places, as Cave himself pointed out in his Secret Life of the Love Song Lecture. A cheesy disco ditty like Rivers of Babylon by Boney M is packed with Old Testament references, but they only come out properly when intoned in Cave's dark brown voice. Indeed, this is a tension that stretches back even further to the metaphysical poets of the 16th and 17th century and the early fathers of the Christian church. But what Cave adds is a brutal post-Darwinian perspective to the whole sorry mess. Rather than battling to keep them apart like a guilty soul star who feels that he's let the church down, he takes lust in one hand, God in the other, and claps. The result is usually some variant on bloody, pointless violence. Although Cave's words can be heartfelt, he is at his best when he's a disinterested observer, even a callous puppet master. Sometimes listening to his bleaker moments, it seems as if he is playing at being God himself, or maybe Satan, or both at once. What's the difference? As the singer said way back in 1988, lyrically, thematically, my work is still chained to the same bowl of vomit. Fortunately, the vomit comes in different colours. At the same time, Cave's art is not clever for its own sake. While the literary and biblical references to his lyrics could fill a book of their own, he can also whip up his band and the audience into a hard-rocking euphoria. He can write sensitively, tenderly about love, then become a growling macho man, dragging his black-suited posse along for a night of ultra-violence. A bad seeds gig can feel as if a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses have taken some very bad drugs with the gang from Reservoir Dogs, then decided to trash a music shop. But it is probably fair to say that a good few people, Cave himself included, wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you for buying Maximum Nick Cave. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. If you did enjoy it or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. Details of our full catalogue are listed on our website, www.chromedreams.co.uk. Thanks again for listening, and goodbye for now.